This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Uh, Nathan, as uh, I'm sure all of you know, is our deputy director. He um, is also very widely published in Roman numismatics. He has um, several monographs under his belt, as well as a couple of edited volumes, um, all of which focus to one point or another on uh, Roman iconography or uh, Roman coinage. And so I'm very happy to uh, introduce him today. He'll be talking about the meanings of libertas on uh, Roman coinage. So Nathan, all yours. All right. Well, thank you, Peter. Um, I think what I'm going to do is, uh, since I'm juggling a PowerPoint and I also have some coins from the vault that I'll sh be uh, showing as I go through, uh, just to keep it simple, I think if uh, you have questions, we'll probably hold them to the end uh, so that there's less multitasking. Uh, but feel free to put them into the chat anytime, and uh, this will probably take me 30 to 40 minutes or so to get through everything, and then, and then we can have a bigger discussion. Um, so today I I'm talking about the meanings of libertas, the personification of liberty on Roman coinage. And uh, if you've ever considered the Roman uh, meaning of liberty, uh, you've probably noticed that uh, studies focus on the Republic uh, because uh, the conception of liberty was very closely connected with Roman thought and ideology in the Republic. Uh, and so many few, uh, mu much fewer studies uh, actually deal with the period of the empire, which is what I'm more interested in. Uh, so today what I'm going to focus on is I'll uh, talk about liberty during the Republic, but also the early empire. Uh, it's my hope one of these days to write a book on Roman liberty uh, and the significance of uh, her appearance on Roman coinage, which I think uh, she connoted a much broader meaning than is often, um, uh, th than we often think. Uh, so first of all, I just want to define libertas. Um, Libertas is a Latin word, uh, which we can translate as freedom or liberty, and in Roman thought, uh, this is literally the opposite condition of slavery. So uh, the Latin word for a freed, freed slave, a freedman, was a libertas, for example, someone who has been freed. Um, when you, we think about uh, libertas in the Roman Republic, or we read about libertas in Roman texts, um, it's also used uh, in extension or as metaphor um, in rhetoric about uh, political protections afforded to citizens. Um, and of course, like many um, qualities or ideals in the Roman world, uh, Libertas was also personified. Uh, that is that she had an image and also had a cult in Rome and statues dedicated to her. Um, but the best visual evidence that still survives for Libertas is, of course, the coinage. Um, and so, as I say, her meaning, her appearance on coinage is typically associated with political protections or the idea of freedom from tyranny. Uh, but what I would like to propose to you today is that she had much broader meanings, and especially in the empire, we see those meanings uh, extended to freedom from taxes or any kind of financial burden. Uh, I'll quickly go through the topography of Libertas, uh, that is uh, where there were monuments in Rome uh, associated with liberty. Uh, so the earliest of these is from the th at least the third century BC. Uh, this is the Atrium Libertatis. It was the place where uh, slaves would go to be manumitted to be freed. So if you owned a slave and you were going to free that slave, you would go to this building to make it official. Uh, and this is where um, the slave would be touched with a, a rod called a windicta and uh, presented with a cap called a peleus, uh, kind of looks like a fez cap. And these are the attributes of libertas you will see are the rod and the cap that is uh, given to them. Um, also, uh, there's a temple of Libertas that seems to have been built in the 3rd century BC, uh, according to Livy, 
And then in the first century, uh, we have a reference to the Temple of Jupiter, Jupiter Libertas, which is also located on the Aventine Hill that Augustus restored. It may in fact be the same temple that was built earlier in the third century BC. Uh, and then when Cicero was exiled from Rome, uh, Clodius built a shrine uh, to Libertas in Cicero's house. Um, and then um, uh, Caesar was also decreed the honor of a temple to Libertas by the Senate after his victory at Munda, where he was presented as a liberator and given the title of liberator. And so um, this was vowed to him, although we have no evidence that it was ever built. And then, of course, in the empire, um, even though Libertas may not be as central to the rhetoric and political ideology uh, as she was in the Republic and the empire, you still um, have her cropping up quite a bit, especially after an emperor who's deemed a tyrant uh, falls and a new emperor rises. So, for example, we have an inscription that survives, which may have been the base for a statue um, that was set up on the first days of Nerva's reign, um, perhaps as a retort to Domitian, suggesting Domitian was a tyrant. And then after Commodus died, uh, we're also told that the Senate removed a statue of his in front of the Senate House and replaced it with a Statue of Liberty. The earliest surviving uh, representation of Libertas uh, is this one on a coin of 126 BC by Caius Cassius. And I actually have the coin here too, so I'll show that to you. Um, if we can switch to the camera. Not sure if it, oh, there it is. Okay, I see it on the other screen. So uh, what you are seeing uh, here on the reverse is of course uh, a quadriga and it's being driven by uh, Libertas and you can see she's holding the rod and uh, the Peleus. So that's how we identify her as Libertas. And then on the obverse of the coin, you have your typical head of Roma and on the reverse, an urn. This is a voting urn. And um, taking all of this symbolism together, uh, this has been interpreted as a reference to the Lex Cassia Tabularia, um, because this is a denarius of Caius Cassius. And this was a law that initiated the secret ballot at trials uh, for non-capital sentences. So this is one of these coins which refers to Libertas in the sense of political protections afforded to citizens. Uh, you have to have some kind of good quality due process for citizens, which you don't necessarily have for non-citizens and slaves. Um, looks like we lost. So do I need to minimize the PowerPoint when I show a coin? Is that what I need to do? Yeah, stop sharing. OK. Start sharing. All right. OK. So um, the next coin is actually the next year, and I don't have this one out, so we'll just stick to the screen on this one. Um, this is a denarius of Marcus Porcius Lyca uh, from 125 BCE, and uh, it's not quite as attractive a coin as the last one I showed you, but I think on the uh, reverse you can still make out Libertas holding the Peleus. Um, that's the Peleus that she's holding, and then you have a victory flying in to crown her additionally on this one. And uh, since this was struck by a Porcius, um, and portrays Libertas. This one appears to refer to the Leges Porciae de Provocatione, which are a series of laws that protected citizens from flogging and summary execution. So again, uh, these are show you how citizens um, are uh, free citizens are treated differently than slaves and non-citizens. So, for example, um, you know, flogging is a punishment typically given to slaves. Uh, this is a law that forbade that from um, uh, for, forbade that kind of punishment for citizens. Um, by the time we get to 76, 75 BCE, um, we have some moneyers who are striking uh, liberty on various coinages. Uh, one of these is Caius Ignatius Maximus. Um, who has a series of several different denarii that refer to Libertas in different ways. And I'm just showing you the one example here, and um, I'll go ahead and 
minimize that PowerPoint so I can show you on the camera the actual coin. Um, let's see if I can zoom that in. And what you see is uh, the Temple of Jupiter Libertas. Um, so one of those temples I referred to earlier. And if you look closely above the two figures, uh, you have um, a thunderbolt above one and a Pelaeus above the other. So these are representations of Jupiter and Libertas. Um, and then, of course, on the obverse here, you have a figure of Cupid. And on other uh, coins in the series, you have Venus or Cupid. Um, the moneyer of the next year, uh, Marcus Farsulius uh, Mensor, also portrayed uh, Libertas on his coinage and also Venus. Um, and these are generally interpreted as um, retorts to Sulla. So the idea here being that Sulla was a, a, a tyrant. Uh, the citizens are now free from Sulla, free from Sullan tyranny. And uh, they also emphasize Venus, uh, either by way of Cupid or Venus herself, to, um, to, to reassert Rome's association with Venus and a goddess of the state, uh, whereas on Sulla, including on his coinage, portrayed uh, Venus in a much more personal kind of way and uh, claimed a special favor from Venus. Um, as we move a bit further, uh, of course, you also have this coin of uh, Marcus Junius Brutus. Uh, this is the famous Brutus who would later assassinate Julius Caesar. Um, but this is 10 years before that in 54 BCE when he is a moneyer. And um, I'm just going to minimize this again so we can switch to our camera and see the coin. Um, actually, I didn't stop the share. There we go. So um, there you can see on the reverse of this coin, you have um, a, a distinguished ancestor of uh, Marcus Junius Brutus, who is Lucius Junius Brutus. Um, the Brutus, the assassin of Caesar, he was uh, adopted uh, into the Brutus family and or the Brutii. And in the Roman world, of course, adoption had the same equivalent or power is blood. So, you know, he was as equal a descendant as any blood relative of the famous Brutus, who in 509 BCE founded the Republic and expelled the last king of Rome. And so this shows his famous ancestor assorted, uh, escorted by lictors as a magistrate, as founder of the Republic. Um, and then, of course, on the head of the, or on the obverse, you have the head of Libertas herself. And so, this refers, of course, to the liberation of the Roman state from monarchy and from tyranny and the founding of the Republic by his ancestor. But there's probably also some subtext in this coinage, uh, whereas we know from Plutarch, among others, that Libertas was important part of the contemporary rhetoric at this period, as Pompey was great, uh, growing in power and um, his ambition was growing and Brutus was part of that opposition to Pompey at the time. And so um, this may may kind of announce, you know, his own uh, misgivings about the growing influence of Pompey Magnus. And then, of course, in the following years, uh, and I'm not going to switch back to the PowerPoint, I'll just show you this one. Um, we have a coin of uh, Polyconus, the money are Polyconus, Marcus Lollius Polyconus. Uh, and this is struck in 45 BCE, um, around or after the time of the Battle of Munda, which was the kind of last uh, decisive battle of the period of the civil wars. And uh, after this battle, uh, Caesar is given the title of liberator, and this is the period when this, uh, the, the uh, Senate vows the Temple of Libertas. And so moneyers who strike uh, during the period of uh, Caesar often also portray Libertas, um, reflecting those honors given to Caesar and his own rhetoric of Libertas. And if you read uh, Caesar's uh, Civil War, his book on the Civil Wars, you'll see that he uses this rhetoric of liberty, that he is saving the Republic from uh, a faction, uh, as he calls it. 
uh, in his own text. And so you see that same idea visualized on the coinage here with the head of Libertas. Uh, on the reverse, uh, this doesn't relate to Caesar so much, but uh, we just have uh, the Navalia, the ship sheds in Rome surmounted by a tribune's bench, and this refers to the moneyer's father who was a tribune. And then, of course, we were joking earlier that I think we whip out this coin every chance we get here at the ANS, the famous uh, Ides of March coin of Brutus from around 42 BCE. Um, so this is, of course, after Caesar has been assassinated and uh, Brutus and Cassius flee Rome uh, and are pursued by Antony and Octavian and eventually die at the Battle of Philippi. Um, uh, but uh, during this period, moneyers striking for Brutus um, produce a wide series of denarii that refer to liberty in different ways. Um, and so here on the reverse, we have not liberty herself, but instead a Peleus, which is the attribute of, of liber Libertas, the cap given to a freed slave, and then two daggers in the legend Ide Mar, referring to the Ides of March. A very clear message about uh, the assassination of Julius Caesar and the message that uh, Caesar was a tyrant and that Brutus and Cassius liberated Rome from a tyrant through his murder. Um, so as I say, this whole series of coinage uh, deals with the image of liberty or her attributes. Um, and we know from the ancient text also that libertas or eleutheria in Greek, um, freedom was the watchword of uh, Brutus and Cassius and the Republican faction in their fight against Antony and Octavian during this period. And so you see this all visualized on the coins as well. All right, let me switch back to my PowerPoint here. All right. So by the time we get to the uh, empire, you do have a general less frequency with which that uh, with which Libertas appears on the coinage. She doesn't appear quite as frequently on the coinage as she did in the Republic. But um, and Carlos Carlos Nureña has written about this. If you know about his book on imperial ideals, uh, he makes this point that she's a pretty minor uh, representation in the empire. Um, and he, he hypothesizes this may be because of the potential awkwardness of a slogan like freedom, libertas, uh, in a period of monarchy. Um, however, he's also looking at this from a macro perspective in, in terms of all of the different personifications that appear on coinage during the empire. And of course, there's a broader range of uh, personifications that appear on coinage in the empire. Um, so she makes pretty small percentage from that perspective, but when she does appear and you're looking at the coinage of an individual emperor, she's oftentimes among the most common image you see on that coin on the coinage of that emperor. And I think that's an important point and why it's important to drill down into the frequencies of coinages of specific emperors rather than taking that long view of uh, it answers different questions, at least than that long view of what kind of images appear over a couple of centuries. Um, so this as of Claudius, for example, uh, which shows Libertas, um, is the most common image on uh, the ases of Claudius struck that year, as has been demonstrated by a die study by von Kainel and also a quantitative study of the coin finds. So uh, very important image in his messaging and um, also appearing at the accession of a Claudius's reign uh, and alongside other types that refer to circumstances regarding his accession. And so I think it's pretty clear that uh, this message can easily be read as a retort to Caligula, the idea that Caligula was a tyrant and Claudius uh, is not going to rule the way uh, Caligula did and that Rome is now free from uh, Caligula's ty tyranny, so to speak. Um, literary sources who talk about uh, the rise of Claudius and uh, uh, the rise of uh, and the fall of Caligula 
also use this rhetoric of liberty and freedom. And so again, this kind of visual deployment of libertas here also correlates well with the literary sources. And um, I couldn't find the exact same coin in the trays when I was looking for, for some reason. Um, but I found another very nice example that I'll show you here uh, from the ANS collection. And um, you can see here just your uh, stat typical, this is the way she typically appears in the empire, standing figure, let me take that zoom out a little bit. And then you can see in her hand, again, uh, the Peleus that she holds the cap of the freed slave. And uh, very often uh, she has this, um, some kind of adjective uh, next to her label. So Libertas Augusta under Claudius, later on uh, Libertas Publica, so Augustan Libertas or public li or, 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 or Libertas Publica, the uh, public liberty is what you typically see on those coins. Um, moving on, uh, we see the same thing after the fall of Nero, after Nero is killed. Uh, of course, after Nero dies, you have the, uh, after Nero's suicide, you have uh, a series of three emperors who rise and fall in quick succession. Uh, and one of these, of course, is Galba. This is a magnificent, magnificent Cistercius of Galba from our collection. And on the reverse, you have uh, Libertas Publica, and uh, so this is that public liberty and you can see again she's holding the cap and then now she's also holding the rod the windicta which is the rod that a slave is touched with during the manumission ceremony and again i think uh, it's it's important to look at these quantitative studies to see how frequent these images were uh, and uh, colin cray's die study of the bronze coinage of galba uh, tells us that this was the most common image on Galba's coinage uh, struck in Rome, uh, was this image of liberty. And uh, again, looking at the texts, we know this was an important part of the political rhetoric right after Nero's death or during the period of the Civil War and the last days of Nero's reign. So when the governor uh, Windex uh, took up arms against uh, Nero and was trying to find someone to lead the, the hostilities against Nero, um, Galba finally answered Windex's call by actually mounting a, a, a tribunal during which a manumission ceremony was taking place. So he's giving a speech against Nero while next to him uh, slaves are being freed during a manumission ceremony. Uh, so think about the imagery uh, of that kind of event. And then we're also told by Suetonius that after Nero died, uh, the people in Rome put on the caps of liberty and partied in the streets. And so again, you have that kind of imagery of uh, freedom from slavery and the notion that Nero was a tyrant. Um, and then uh, I think I'll switch back to my PowerPoint real quick. Yes. Whoops. I have a pop up on my computer. Okay. Got it. Okay. All right, we got it. Um so did we miss the one for there it is uh, so interestingly we don't have one of these here at the ans uh, but they're actually the most common uh, type um, from 71 ce and vespasian's reign this is another die study of colin cray's uh, that indicates this uh, frequency uh, but it's the same kind of design you see on the coinage of uh, of um, of Galba, you have that same representation of liberty with libertas publica, uh, which of course must again be a retort uh, to Nero. Uh, now, even though we don't have this uh, coin in our collection, we do have a type from the same year of Vespasian. Um, so there you can see Vespasian, and then on the reverse, you have this inscription 
uh, regarding liberty, and it says the Senate and the Roman people to the champion of public liberty. And so this is Vespasian, the champion of public liberty, being honored by the Senate. Uh, so again, kind of that anti-Neronian political rhetoric. And then, of course, uh, after Domitian uh, is killed um, and Nerva rises to power, you'll remember I told you at the beginning that the Senate sets up a, an honorary inscription to uh, Liberty and um, may have been a statue that they actually erected after Domitian's assassination. Um, and then, of course, on the reverse of these coins of Nerva, and we see them on Ori, Denarii, and all the bronze denominations, you have, again, the same image of Libertas Publica, public liberty, appearing. And um, in my own study of these and uh, looking at coin finds, this is the second most common image on, on, uh, on uh, the bronze coinage of Nerva is liberty. So clearly playing a, a big visual role on his coinage. Uh, very clearly, I think, a retort to Domitian, who was characterized as a tyrant. And again, a coherence with literary sources. If you look at contemporary writers such as Pliny and Marshall and Tacitus, you know, they use this rhetoric of liberty. They talk about Domitian as a tyrant. Um, and even Marshall, uh, the poet, writes his 11th epigram in 96 in the first months of, of um, Ner Nerva's reign. And it has as its theme the Saturnalia, which the festival of the Saturnalia, but it also uses this, uses this rhetoric of liberty and license, which can be read in a more political way as referring to the aftermath of Domitian and the new freedom that the Romans enjoy under Nerva. All right. So I'm going to switch back to the PowerPoint again. What? Okay. So now I want to talk to you a little bit about evidence of other conceptions of liberty. So uh, we have this uh, quadrons of Caligula. Um, I think they were struck roughly 39 to 41. And they don't portray liberty per se, but what you can see. Um, on one side is the cap of liberty, that Peleus flanked by the uh, SC for the decree of the Senate. And then on the reverse, you have this RCC. Now these have been interpreted in various ways, uh, but to make the long story short, I think the only really tenable reading of these is referring to a half percent, uh, the remission of a half percent tax on auction sales in Italy. Uh, and that's what that RCC is an abbreviation for, is the remissa ducentissima. So the CC is, a, is the abbreviation for the half percent, and the R is the abbreviation for the remissa. And this is a tax that uh, went to the military treasury and... Um, and uh, 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 Caligula seems to have abolished it. Uh, this kind of message makes sense on the quadrantes. This is primarily an urban coinage that circulated in Rome and Italy. And if you um, study quadrantes, you know that they don't really deal with the grand political narrative you often see on other coin denominations, but rather that they often deal with these kind of mundane um, more practical daily life concerns that the uh, common people of the city of Rome and Italy uh, dealt with. So uh, this kind of remission of a small tax on auction sales would be something more of interest to them, perhaps. Um, and then later on, you have uh, coins like this of Galba, which again portray li liberty, very similar to the Libertas Publica type we saw before. Um, but this one, um, you see abbreviated, it's L-I-B, so Libertas, A-U-G, AUG, uh, Libertas Augusta. And then on the other side, you see uh, R-X-L. And so this R-X-L is the remissa um, uh, 
quadrigensuma, which is the remission of uh, the two and a half percent custom duties on goods that entered Gaul. And we know that that's exactly what this means because there are other coins of Galba uh, with other designs that actually spell out remissa quadrigensuma full in Latin text. So there can be no doubt that this refers to freedom from a customs duty that Galba remitted. So these two coins, these coins of Galba and Caligula show us that Libertas is not only connected with, uh, in the empire, is not only connected with political protections and freedom from tyranny, but also uh, freedom from financial burdens, namely taxes and customs duties. Um, and I was able to find a number of, of texts as well that suggests that there was also this connection in the Roman mind and in rhetoric about Libertas being connected with relief from financial burdens. Um, so free cities in uh, Latin, uh, Kiwitates Liberi, were cities that were not always exempted from taxes, but typically. Um, there's also this passage in Livy referring to the liberation of Macedonia and Illyria, uh, where he says that it's not possible for liberty to exist under the rule of the tax farmer. Um, and then you have other authors like uh, um, Quintus Curtius, uh, who connects libertas with immunitas, which is freedom from tribute, so cities that don't have to pay tribute. Uh, Seneca similarly does the same thing. And then in Tacitus's um, Historiae, he has this uh, scene where he recounts the speech of Cavillus at the start of the Batavian Revolt. And um, there's also this rhetoric of liberty um, and freedom from taxation that comes up there. So before I go further, um, I just wanna address briefly something that comes up sometimes in numismatic literature and other literature, which is uh, an old idea. I think it was more or less developed in the earlier part of the 20th century to the mid-century that libertas can be a substitute for liberalitas. Uh, liberalitas is liberality, generous giving uh, is what she means in Latin. Uh, we can translate libertas, of course, as freedom. Um, and these were ideas that were popularized, among others, by um, Hammond and uh, Stilo, uh, who actually wrote a dissertation about libertas and liberalitas. And I, I personally reject the, the um, amalgamation of these two. I think they're two very different things. Um, first of all, they're two very different words with different meaning. One is generous giving and one is freedom or freedom from something. Um, also, as uh, you can see here on examples of coinage, they have very different attributes. Libertas is a female personification who typically holds the Vindicta and or the Peleus. And Liberalitas, on the other hand, is a male personification and often holds uh, this counting device that Martin Beckman has written about. Uh, in the second century, Liberalitas becomes a synonym for the Congiarium, the distribution of of cash payments by the emperor in Rome. Um, Carlos Nureña has, has noted that libertas and liberalitas do not fluctuate together in any meaningful way in his quantitative studies. And so he also kind of rejects the association. Um, and actually both libertas and liberalitas appear uh, on coinage separately with different attributes and everything on the reign of, in the reign of Hadrian on his coinage. And so, Personally, I, uh, I, I reject this idea that the two are one in the same or can be one in the same. Now, looking at the reign of Trajan, um, we see Libertas coming up again uh, in the empire. But what is really interesting now is that Libertas is appearing not as, the not as a retort to the previous emperor. So think about it before. You have Libertas appearing on coins of Claudius after Caligula, who was deemed a tyrant. You have him on coins of Vis uh, Galba and Vitellius and um, Vespasian, all referring back to Nero, who was characterized as a tyrant. And then on coins of Nerva, 
who, which referred back to Domitian, who was characterized as a tyrant. But of course, Trajan follows Nerva, who was deified and uh, who had adopted Trajan. So this cannot be referring to Nerva as a tyrant or anything like that. He was a well-remembered and deified emperor. Uh, so there must be some other kind of interpretation for Libertas on the coinage of Trajan. Um, what you typically read uh, is that Libertas on his coinage is uh, simply reflecting the rhetoric of the day, that Trajan's reign was an age of liberty. And if you're a text scholar and you read Tacitus and Pliny who are writing during the reign of Trajan, this makes sense since Libertas was such a central part of the rhetoric of, of the day uh, and so prominent in the texts. Um, but, you know, since these are appearing in the middle of the reign and at different periods of the reign, I think if we look a little closer, maybe we can find that she's appearing for other reasons. So this top coin here, which is actually unique, uh, come fr from the Mazzini collection, um, it was struck in 102, 101 or 102, and we know that in 102, Trajan is returning to Rome from his first victory in Dacia. And one of the first things he does when he gets back to Rome is he forgives tax debts. This is a massive tax forgiveness that he, he um, does in Rome. And so I think Libertas is appearing here uh, as a reference to uh, that tax remission that's also happening in that same year. Um, you also see uh, Libertas appearing on these coins of 108 to 110, these Ori, um, and they are struck right about the same time of coins referring to the Alimenta, um, also on gold coins. Uh, and the Alimenta is a, a kind of welfare program or subsidy program for the children of Italy, both wealthy and common people. Uh, benefit from this scheme. Uh, so you get uh, public money, public support uh, in the Alimenta for having children. And of course, raising children is a financially burdensome affair. And so I believe that these uh, appearances of Libertas refer uh, also to this kind of um, public uh, program of the Alimenta. And uh, in fact, Pliny connects the Alimenta program of Trajan explicitly with both Libertas and Securitas. He says that the Alimenta provides both Libertas, freedom, and Securitas, security. And so interestingly, not only are you seeing images of the Alimenta on coins at the same times you're seeing uh, Libertas on the coins of Trajan, but you're also seeing Securitas on those coins as well. So you have that same kind of um, uh, panegyrical program as uh, articulated by Pliny, visualized on the coinage as well. And if we move on to the reigns, uh, uh, to the reign of Hadrian, um, Libertas also appears on his coinage. And again, uh, the typical interpretation for these is that they represent the age of liberty. You know, this rhetoric of liberty is continuing because Hadrian, you know, uh, deified Trajan. Um, Trajan was a good emperor. They don't refer to him as a tyrant or anything like that. So why does liberty appear on his coinage and also in the midst of the reign as opposed to at the accession as they did in the first century? And you can make these same kinds of connections with either a tax forgiveness or the Alimenta. So on Hadrian's coins, for example, uh, down here at the bottom, what you see is a seated personification of Libertas holding the rod. She doesn't have this Peleus this time. She's got a branch instead, which kind of throws us off. But we can read the text around her, labeling her as Libertas Publica, so we know who she is. Um, and this is struck at the same time as other coins uh, showing uh, someone here lighting fire to the tax records. And um, this is what the, the legend on the coin actually says, is that old receipts of 900 million sesterci are abolished. And so this is the burning of the tax records in the forum and public tax uh, debt forgiveness. 
and Libertas's image appearing at that same time. Um, we also have an extension of the Alimenta at approximately this same time as well. And so you can also read Libertas in a different way here, which is um, she could refer to the tax forgiveness, but she could also refer to the extension of the Alimenta. And I want to remind you what Pliny said in his Panegyric of Trajan about the Alimenta providing both liberty and security. And so we have the same message here uh, with both Securitas and Libertas appearing at the same time as, uh, you know, an Alimenta's extension taking place. Um, and this is, of course, uh, as I've said before, I think one of the beauties of personifications, which until recently have not been so appreciated in numismatic scholarship, because we, we really enjoy these very specific historical types that refer to things like cash distributions or games or public building or something like that. But yet in the empire, personifications become the most common depictions. Uh, in the modern day, we tend to find them less interesting, less visually interesting, but they were potent communicators because depending on who you were, you could read these different ways based on your interface with the Roman state, which brings me to um, my conclusion. Uh, well, actually not my conclusion. I want to show you this other type here. Um, so this is a, a type of uh, Hadrian. Um, we see him seated on a platform with a woman sitting in front of him or standing in front of him with a child. Uh, this is referring to the Alimenta, that, uh, that, uh, that, that program to support the children of Italy I was talking about. And then below, if you read closely, you have the legend Libertas Restituta, the restoration of Libertas, the restoration of freedom, clearly visually connected with the idea of the Alimenta here, like Pliny, and again struck in the same year as coins also portraying um, Securitas, as Pliny said that the Alimenta provided both Libertas and Securitas. And I do have these coins here to show you. I just haven't switched yet, so we can uh, save a little time, but I'll show them to you at the end. Um, but uh, to come to my conclusion here, I was talking about the accessibility of personifications. I think they were very potent communicators in the Roman world, because as I said, depending on who you were in Roman society and what your interface with the state was, you could have interpreted a personification differently uh, because uh, these slogans or phrases like liberty or fortune or, or hope or whatever mean different things to different people. So, you know, many people may not have cared one way or the other who the emperor was. The Senate obviously cared very much so, especially when they were abused by a certain emperor. Uh, and we often typically interpret the image of liberty through the lens of, of senators and their experiences. But one of the things that we, the ancient sources tell us, if they can be trusted, is that when Claudius came to power, um, he also rescinded a number of taxes that Cal Caligula had imposed. Um, so taxes on edibles, a 2.5% tax on litigation and trials, a 12.5% tax on wages of people who carried loads, uh, tax on prostitution and pandering and some other taxes as well. So, you know, while a common person may not have cared whether it was Claudius or Caligula who was emperor, uh, you know, they might have cared uh, about taxes, especially if they were in the prostitution business and subjected to a new tax or something like that. Uh, and the same thing in the reign of Nerva, uh, where, uh, where uh, the literary sources, if they're again to be trusted, uh, tell us that, you know, most people were actually pretty ambivalent about the change of the emperor. The army was upset because they loved Domitian. Uh, the common people really didn't care one way or the other, and the Senate was overjoyed um, because they hated Domitian. But Nerva had also remitted a number of taxes or made some financial reforms such as removing wrongful accusations under the Fiscus Judaicus, which was a problem in Domitian's reign. Um, he, um, 
he he remitted the obligation of Italian cities to support the imperial courier. There were more exceptions to the inheritance tax. And then if you had a dispute with the treasury, uh, whereas before you had to argue before a, uh, a procurator, uh, which was a very unfair proceeding because procurators got got a cut of of a judgment. Um, he he reformed these so that they were argued before a praetor, uh, and this allowed them to be heard more objectively. And Trajan com- continued that reform as well. Uh, so I think again, this image of liberty, while it may have meant something to a senator on the coinage of Nerva, may have meant something else to to other people on the social ladder or however their interface with the Roman state uh, was. And um, so what I'll be doing, uh, what I need to do uh, as part of my study, continuing studies on Roman liberty is of course, look beyond uh, the reigns of Trajan and Hadrian on the imperial coinage. Uh, She appears uh, well into the Antonine period, third century and also the fourth century. Uh, and, you know, I'd like to go through and see if we can associate more of these with tax remission and tax forgiveness, which is uh, um, kind of a newer way of thinking about liberty and the rhetoric of liberty and the empire, I think. And I also need to look at her representations on uh, the provincial coinage and see uh, what she means there. Uh, so this is just kind of my thoughts and work in progress. and. Uh, I I hope uh, you've been able to appreciate looking at Liberty in uh, maybe a different light than you've seen her on Roman coinage before. Um, And I'll quickly show you these these few coins of Hadrian that I kind of skipped over to get through the presentation. Um, So here's the type uh, showing uh, the burning of the tax records in the forum on this Cistercius of Hadrian. It's a really great Cistercius. Um, and then we have the type of the seated Libertas. Again, somewhat unusual since she's holding the branch instead of the typical Peleus. And then uh, here's this great one, which has the Alimenta scene, but instead of labeling it uh, the Alimenta, as is typically done, we have right here on the bottom uh, the label libertas restituta libertas restored so all right well thank you very much and i'm happy to take any any questions if you have them all right so i'm seeing a question in the chat is there any significance to the fact that the word libertatis on the denarius of Polyconus is in the genitive case. Um, my assumption there, and I could be wrong, but I think it's a descriptor of the head, uh, of the female head on it. Um, that is, this is a head of liberty. Um, I, 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 I don't know of any other interpretation, at least not one that comes to mind. Um, Maybe somebody else does. We have someone with their hand up. Peter, do you want to ask? Yeah. Um, that was fascinating. Thank you so much. I was really intrigued because I've done work on research in the statue of Marcius on the Roman Forum who was referred to as Mendicium Libertatis. And he appears on the Anaglyphic Triani in the scene of tax remissions. But it's a really interesting idea to connect that Martius and the idea of imperial liberty with that monument. Mm-hmm. Um, so just, you know, this is very interesting to look at. And I also wonder, in the Republican period, is there any sense of Libertas being associated with freedom of speech and other types of Libertas than kind of just political Libertas? 
Right. Um, yeah, so you had mentioned the statue of Marcius in the Forum in the Republic and on the Anaglypha Triani, and she also or he also appears on a, on coins of Marcius Censorinus in the Republic. Um, you know, I've kind of side, uh, sidestepped to the Marcius statue myself. Um, I'm kind of following the lead of Valentina Arena, who has done the same thing. Uh, she she does not believe that the Marcius statue really refers to to liberty and taxes in that kind of way, uh, because the the source that refers to that is Servius, who is a late fourth century source, and her interpretation is that this is this is all Neoplatonic, and so it's a retroject. So our understanding is a retrojection onto the Republican past. Um, and uh, I, I, I did an article on Libertas in the reigns of Trajan and Hadrian, so kind of that last bit I talked about in my talk in the American Journal of Archaeology 2021. Um, and so I have a bit there on the Marcius statue and, and Valentina Arena's interpretations there. Um, I can, um, so, so anyway, that's, that's kind of where I am on that. Uh, I'll put my email in the chat there so that uh, uh, if, if, if I can send the citation if you don't have it already. Um, what was the second question? Um, just wondering about um, Marcia, about libertas oh, and freedom of speech. Right. Um, so I haven't done a lot of digging into that uh, particular topic. Um, I do know it is a thing in the Republic, and I expect it's probably pretty well covered in Valentina Arena's book. Um, one thing I do know is particularly in the poetry of the Augustan period, and Horace, for example, uh, you know, the Augustan poets use this this language of libertas, not so much in a political sense, but in a personalized sense. They personalize the rhetoric of libertas uh, because Augustus is a ruler that allows freedom of speech. And so, you know, this rhetoric of libertas also comes with the freedom to write obscene verse and erotic poetry and that kind of thing. Um, and so you kind of get a lot of body poetry, uh, body B A W D Y, uh, poetry at this at this time in the age of Augustus, referring to it that way, and um, you know, in the in the age of Nerva, I think you see the same thing happening with uh, Marshall's eleventh book on the Saturnalia, and there's um, some obscene epigrams uh, there too as well, and he's again referring to this rhetoric of liberty and freedom. Uh, now under Nerva. So I, I, you know, he's kind of emulating the Augustan poets in that way, I think, with the freedom of speech. So. Um, any other questions, comments? Uh, so I'm seeing one from Nathaniel Katz. Uh, you mentioned that Libertas is one of the most personification of coins of emperors like Claudius and Nerva, where it talks, maybe talks about uh, tyranny and taxes. When Libertas appears in a more purely economic sense on the coins of emperors like Hadrian, is it as frequent? Uh, you know, I haven't quantified the coinage of um, Hadrian, so I don't know. Um, I. I you know, my sense is, and again, I haven't really dug into this, but I think the the Libertas images are less common uh, in Hadrian's reign uh, than they were, say, in the reign of Claudius or Nerva. But again, I haven't done any kind of quantification there myself. Uh, Gilles says, is it possible to visualize on a chart the occurrences of Libertas spread by issuing authority in the AA? Well, I guess so, yes. He gives us a link. Uh, is that a, showing up on the screen? Uh, not everybody's link. Okay, yeah, if you click on the link, you'll see something. Uh, one thing I do want, the seminar students will know what I'm talking about here. One caveat I want to give uh, here with a chart like that is when it refers to types, um, 
you know, that can that that can sometimes give you a false sense of frequency because when we catalog something, um, you know, we assign different variations and so on and so forth. But something, even if it's known by a single coin, will have a catalog entry. So at one catalog entry where there might be 5,000 known examples and one catalog entry where there's one known example will look like equals that way. So when you're actually thinking about how frequent or how common an image was in antiquity, I think it's better to look at die studies uh, or, or uh, excavation finds or hoard finds or something like that to get a better sense of the relationship of, of the frequency of images to one another. But absolutely, ochre and and mantis and digital resources like that are great just to get a sense of what kind of images were out there in the first place. <clears throat> I'm seeing another one. Um, how common is the Hadrian Cistercius showing, showing the burning of the tax records and about what year was that? Uh, that was 119 to 120, I think. Uh, let me take a look. Uh, yeah, 119, 121. And um, it's a very rare type. It's not terribly common. Um, I can't be any more specific than that, but it is, it is a rare type. I think this might be the only example of this type in our collection at the ANS. That is also an image you see on the Chatsworth relief, uh, the burning of the tax records. <clears throat> 